So in this video, we are going to look at a phenylalanine deaminase test, and we will start by talking about day one, which is going to be the setup. And this is activity 5-12. So the purpose of the phenylalanine deaminase test is to determine whether bacteria can deaminate phenylalanine. And so in the last video, we talked about decarboxylation, meaning that bacteria will remove the carboxyl group from an amino acid. In this case, we're now looking at deamination, which is the removal of the amino group. And so again, we're still looking at what bacteria do with proteins, but instead of looking at decarboxylation, now we are looking at deamination, so removing the amino group from the amino acid. So this experiment would be done in pairs, and you would get two phenylalanine slants. So the name of the media for your biochemical sheet is a phenylalanine slant. So here are my phenylalanine slants, and you would work in pairs, and you would label one PM, that is for Proteus mirabilis, and you would label the other EC for E. coli. And so what you would do is you would use a loop, and you would do your zigzag inoculation, for the slant. So you would do that for Proteus mirabilis, and then you would repeat the same procedure for the E. coli. And so you would inoculate those slants, and then you would put the cap on, do it a half turn loose, so just loosen the cap a little bit. You want it to wiggle, but not fall off. And then once you inoculate both tubes with the cap loose, you would put them in the incubator, and then at 48 hours, you would take them out and do the readout. So here's a video showing you how to do this. So in this experiment, this is going to be a phenylalanine deaminase test. And so what I have is I have a phenylalanine slant. This contains the amino acid phenylalanine. And there are two bacteria that are going to be used for this experiment. We have E. coli, so here's our E. coli. And we have Proteus mirabilis. And so you can see that they're both growing on the slant. Now, normally I would have two of these tubes. I would inoculate one with E. coli, and the other one I would inoculate with the Proteus mirabilis. Again, for demonstration purposes, I'm only gonna inoculate one, so I'm gonna move this one out of the way. I'm going to inoculate with the Proteus mirabilis. So again, I would make sure that my tube is well labeled. Then I'm going to flame my loop. I'm inoculating the slant, so it's a zigzag inoculation. and I'm going to let it cool. So while that's cooling, these are screw tops, so I need to loosen. I just accidentally touched it to the burner while I was doing that. Okay, I'm going to loosen my screw tops and I'm letting my loop cool. So now I'm going to pick up bacteria from the slant and transfer it to the phenylalanine slant. So I'm gonna take the cap off, I'm going to flame, and I'm gonna go in and I'm going to pick up some of the bacteria. I don't need a lot, flame, cap back on, and I'm going to inoculate my phenylalanine slant. So I take the cap off, flame it, and I'm gonna go in and do my zigzag inoculation. So starting at the base, I'm just going to zigzag, coming up, flame it, cap, and then flame my loop before I set it down. Okay, now I would repeat this with the other organism as well. And with these tubes, notice again they're screw tops, so I wanna make sure that I tighten the cap all the way, and then you wanna give it about a half turn to loosen it. It should wiggle, but not fall off. And so you would do that for both tubes, and then you would put these in the incubator, and after the 48 hours, then you would add the reagent to test for the phenylalanine deamination. And so this is how we set up our phenylalanine deaminase test. So now we're gonna talk about the readout for our phenylalanine deaminase test. So this would be day two of our experiment. 
So the purpose of our phenylalanine deaminase test is to determine whether bacteria can deaminate phenylalanine. So in the media, again, the name of the media would be a phenylalanine slant. So you could write that in. It's a phenylalanine slant. And so in the media, we have yeast extract. And yeast extract would be there for general growth. It's just there as a undefined component to allow the bacteria to grow. Then we have our phenylalanine. That is our amino acid substrate. That's the substrate that we're testing to see if bacteria can deaminate. Now, if you've ever looked at aspartame, aspartame goes under two kind of trade names, so NutraSweet or Equal. Those are two sugars that contain aspartame. This is an artificial sweetener that is actually, instead of a sugar, it is a dipeptide. Di means two, so two amino acids linked together. And it's phenylalanine and aspartic acid. And they're combined with methanol. And when you put these two amino acids together, it's 180 times sweeter than sugar. And so this was used as an artificial sweetener to replace sugar. For example, if patients were diabetic and couldn't consume sugar. So aspartame was this artificial sweetener. Now, why am I telling you about aspartame? Well, notice that this artificial sweetener contains phenylalanine. And so if you've ever looked at like sugarless gum or Diet Coke, sometimes you'll see a warning on it and it says may contain phenylalanine. And you might wonder, well, what does that mean? Well, the reason that warning is there is because some people are born with a condition called phenylketonuria, PKU. And patients who have PKU, they're born with it. It's a genetic disease. You inherit it from your parents. And for PKU, basically what it means is that you are born with an enzyme deficiency in an enzyme that would metabolize phenylalanine. And so what happens in patients who have PKU is that they have to be on a low-protein diet and they have to be on a low-protein diet because they can't take in phenylalanine. Because if they take in phenylalanine, phenylalanine, they are not able to break down. Their enzyme is defective. And so phenylalanine builds up in the blood. And especially in children when their brain is developing, if that phenylalanine level gets high, it can cause brain damage. And so if you've ever seen like in a hospital when babies are born and they prick their feet and they take a little bit of blood, one of the things that they're testing for is PKU. Because if they know that that child has PKU, their basically treatment would be a low protein diet. They need to watch how much protein they consume because if they consume proteins, they're going to contain phenylalanine. And patients who have PKU cannot metabolize that phenylalanine. So you might wonder, well, okay, they can't take in proteins. Can you survive without proteins? And the answer is no, you still need some proteins. And so typically people who have PKU, there is this like milk formula that they drink. Um, and that milk contains the other amino acids, but not phenylalanine. And so it allows patients who have PKU to get those other amino acids that they need without taking in phenylalanine. Now, how do I know this? My kid's father, uh, my ex, he has two brothers who have PKU. Neither of his parents had PKU, so they had no idea that that disease, that either parent carried it. But just by chance, his parents were both carriers. Those carriers had kids. My ex is the oldest. He was born first. He did not have PKU. Then the next brother came along. He had PKU. The next brother came along. He had PKU, which is pretty rare because the probability of getting one child with PKU is one out of four. So to end up with two out of three getting PKU is pretty rare.
because again, if it was one fourth times one fourth for the second kid, there's a one sixteenth probability that you end up with two kids that have PKU. It's just not very likely. And so that's a pretty rare thing. They actually had two kids that were born with PKU. And so when the boys were younger, they had to do blood testing, kind of like a diabetic has to do to check their sugars. They would have to have their phenylalanine levels checked because they had to make sure that they would maintain a low protein diet. And so basically you can think of it like being vegan right? So no milk, no dairy, no meat, etc. And then even plant-based proteins, they have to be careful as well. And so if they, if their phenylalanine levels got high, especially when they were developing as a kid, it was a higher chance or higher risk of causing brain damage. Now that they're adults and they're older, um, they're a little bit looser with their diet, they, there's not as much of a chance for damage now that they're a little bit older. But as a kid, when the brain is developing, keeping phenylalanine levels low is really important. And so there have been several treatments that have been tried. Um, at one point, they were in a uh, clinical trial for a drug where they basically had to take like 20 pills with a meal and then they could eat protein. So they were part of this trial where they got to try protein. So they got to try, you know, different protein sources that they wanted. One brother was a little more adventurous. He wanted to try things. The other brother was, you know, in his 20s by then. And he didn't want to really, he wasn't interested in trying meat because he had never really seen it or eaten it. And it just didn't interest him. And so one brother tried it, the other didn't. Um, but basically what they found through the trial was that the medication was not effective. And so they had to go back to their low protein diet. And so unfortunately, they're still on this low protein diet. And maybe at some point there will be a better therapy. But for now, PKU can largely be um, controlled through diet. As long as you're on a low protein diet, the condition can be very well controlled. So now back to aspartame. So patients who have PKU, they have to avoid phenylalanine. So if you think about sugarless gum, you don't think there's going to be any protein in that, right? Who would ever think there's going to be protein in there? However, if it's sweetened with aspartame, that aspartame is going to contain phenylalanine. And so that's why you see those warnings on products that have aspartame because that warning basically serves to say may contain phenylalanine and therefore it's warning people who have phenylketonuria, PKU, not to eat or not to chew that gum because they would be taking in phenylalanine or to drink Diet Coke because they would be taking in phenylalanine. And so next time, you know, you go to something and you see that warning, it's because of the aspartame and it's because the aspartame, that sweetener, contains phenylalanine and people who have PKU cannot digest phenylalanine and so they have to avoid it through diet. So let's look at our phenylalanine deaminase and talk about our readout. So what we have is we have our phenylalanine. This is our amino acid. So you can see here is the amino group, here is the carboxyl group, here is this alpha carbon, Here's a hydrogen, and then here is the R group. Now, the reason this is referred to as phenylalanine, alanine is an amino acid, and it basically, its R group is just a methyl group, meaning it's just a CH3. It doesn't have all this extra part. So alanine is just a methyl group. Now, if we look at this ring, this is a benzene ring. It's a six carbon ring that has alternating double bonds. That type of ring is also referred to as a phenyl group. So this is why it's called phenylalanine. This phenyl group is this ring part here. And then this is alanine, which is another amino acid. So that's why this amino acid is referred to as phenylalan phenylalanine. So this is going to be your amino acid substrate. 
Now, when we're breaking things down, remember that we are going to do hydrolysis. So water is going to be put in, and the water is going to deaminate, meaning it's going to remove this amino group. Now, notice that this substrate, phenylalanine, is relatively small, right? It's not a big, bulky substrate. It's relatively small. And so as a result, phenylalanine is able to get into the cell. And so phenylalanine deaminase is going to be an endoenzyme. So here is this amino group that is going to be removed. Phenylalanine deaminase is going to be an endoenzyme because again, this substrate is relatively small. And when we get this deamination, this is going to remove ammonia. So notice water has to be put in. So a hydrogen goes here. And what's left is this phenylpyruvic acid. So at the end of this process, you end up with two products. You have your ammonia and you have the phenylpyruvic acid. These are going to be your two products. Now, when we do this test, we are going to add five drops of ferric chloride. We add it to the slant and then we rock it back and forth. Now, the ferric chloride, the FeCl3, is going to detect that phenylpyruvic acid. It's detecting this specific product. So the ferric chloride itself is yellow, and if phenylpyruvic acid is present, the ferric chloride is going to turn green. So notice that this slant is green. When it's green, that tells us that that phenylpyruvic acid was produced. The phenylpyruvic acid interacts with the ferric chloride and it turns that green color. Now, this ferric chloride is going to be a reagent, right? We're going to add it after the test is complete, after we've grown our tube for 48 hours. So our ferric chloride is going to be our reagent. That's the name of our reagent, and this is what it's going to detect. So now there is no pH indicator in this test. So when you're filling out your biochemical sheet under pH indicator, you're going to put none. Look at the two products that you get. We have ammonia and we have phenylpyruvic acid. So notice something about these products. What is the pH like of ammonia? Answer is, pH of ammonia is going to be alkaline. What would you predict the pH would be like for the phenylpyruvic acid? It's an acid, so it's going to be acidic. So ammonia is a base, and phenylpyruvic is an acid. They're going to cancel each other out. And therefore, as a result, we can't use a pH indicator. So there is no pH indicator in this test. We can't use it because the two products would cancel each other out. So instead, we have our reagent. And our reagent in this case is the ferric chloride, and it's going to detect the phenylpyruvic acid. And if phenylpyruvic acid is present, it's going to turn green. So the negative in this test, meaning that bacteria do not produce phenylalanine deaminase, the negative is going to stay yellow. That's the color of the reagent to begin. So what that tells us is that if it stays yellow, there was no phenylpyruvic acid produced, which means that the bacteria do not contain the enzyme. They do not have the phenylalanine deaminase. They are not able to deaminate phenylalanine. So the negative would be this. Positive is going to turn green on the slant. And so if it turns green, that tells us that the phenylpyruvic acid is present, and that's why it turns green, because the ferric chloride with the phenylpyruvic acid is going to turn green. So green is our positive, yellow is our negative. That means that phenylpyruvic acid was not produced. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the video of me adding the ferric chloride to the slant 
so that you can see what that readout is going to look like. So this is our readout for the phenylalanine deaminase test. And so what we have is we have our two bacteria that are growing on our phenylalanine slants. This is our Proteus mirabilis, and this is our E. coli. And so those have already been inoculated and incubated, and they're already grown. To detect if phenylalanine is deaminated, we are going to use a reagent, and the reagent is called ferric chloride. Ferric chloride is going to detect phenylpyruvic acid, which is a product of the deamination of phenylalanine. So we are going to see if the phenylalanine is deaminated. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add five drops of the ferric chloride to each of these slants, and then I'm going to rock them back and forth to get the ferric chloride to go onto the slant. So we'll start with Proteus mirabilis. I wanna make sure that I don't contaminate my dropper. So I'm gonna open this. One, two, three, four, five. Cap. And then I'm gonna repeat it for the other two. One, two, three, four, five. Cap. And then I'm gonna put the cap back on my ferric chloride. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my tube and I'm going to rock it back and forth so that I can get the ferric chloride to cover the bacteria that's on the slant. And I'm going to do that for both. Now you might notice that the ferric chloride itself is yellow. So if it stays yellow, that is going to be a negative in this test. So let me just go ahead and mix the E. coli again. Sorry, this one is Proteus mirabilis. This one was E. coli. So if I look at my Proteus mirabilis, you can see that it is green. So if I turn it kind of to the side, you can see that it's green. So the Proteus mirabilis is the one that is positive for phenylalanine deaminase. It changed color to green. If I were to look at the E. coli, the E. coli is going to be negative. It stayed yellow, which means it did not produce phenylpyruvic acid. And so this would be how you would do your readout for your phenylalanine deaminase. And so the, these are my two tubes side by side, Proteus mirabilis here, E. coli here, and Proteus mirabilis would be my positive. And so that's my phenylalanine deaminase. And so here is my readout. So what I have is on the left, I have my Proteus mirabilis. Notice that it turned green, which is positive for phenylalanine deaminase. And so this particular bacteria produced the phenylalanine deaminase, produced the enzyme, and it was able to deaminate phenylalanine and it produced the phenylpyruvic acid, and the phenylpyruvic acid interacted with the ferric chloride when it was added, and it caused the ferric chloride to turn green. Whereas E. coli is going to be negative, because for E. coli, notice it did not turn green, it stayed yellow, which means that E. coli does not produce the phenylpyruvic acid, meaning it does not make the phenylalanine deaminase. It's not able to deaminate phenylalanine and therefore does not produce the phenylpyruvic acid. And so the ferric chloride has nothing to react with. So Proteus mirabilis is going to be my positive and E. coli is going to be my negative. Now for this test, you don't have to memorize which bacteria gave which result. That is not the point of this. The point of this is just to see can you read these out? Do you know what the positive looks like? Do you know what the negative looks like? And so when we look at our phenylalanine deaminase test, notice that when we do our deamination test, 
that this is on a slant. This is aerobic. So under the aerobic conditions, the proteins are deaminated, right? So when oxygen is present, proteins can be deaminated. If you remember the decarboxylase experiment, though, in the decarboxylase experiment, that had mineral oil on it. That process was anaerobic. So a difference between deamination and, and decarboxylation, deamination is aerobic. Again, think of it being on the slant, whereas anaerobic is when proteins would be decarboxylated. So that's when the carboxyl group would be removed. And so this is going to be our conclusion for our phenylalanine deaminase test.